everyone, Misko Electric here, and today I'm at the North American International Auto Show. That's right, this is the Detroit Auto Show that happens typically in the wintertime, but now it's in the fall. Much better weather, there are gonna be a lot of activities outdoors as well. We're gonna go inside and check out all the electric vehicles, and hopefully we'll get to spot a special guest. The President of the United States is actually touring the show right now, so let's head inside. All right, right behind us, we see Mary Barra, who is in charge of GM. She is the CEO. They are getting ready to showcase some of their products to the President of the United States. Right behind me, you'll see the Blazer EV and also the Silverado EV. We were in those actually at the Woodward Dream Cruise. They are glassed off now, so we're not gonna be able to get another peek inside, but I'm really excited to see all the way in the back, they actually have the Equinox EV on display. So we're gonna go over there and check it out. Can I have your attention please? The show floor is now closed to all credential media. Please make your way Most members of the media watched the president's tour from the lobby through this glass. We were locked out for a few hours and things got weird. All right guys, I know I'm here to cover the future of the automotive industry, but we got the old too. This is a dinosaur at the auto show, can you believe it? I don't know why. <laughs> They're here for kids, that's why. So get excited because there are some prehistoric creatures and some really cool future. Oh look, he's trying to give me a hug. Oh. So precious, so precious. Oh. Okay, I like the old a little bit, but we don't like to use dino juice to power our vehicles. We like e-mobility. So let's go find some more electric cars. Finally, the doors were open and the herd went back to the pasture. We're headed straight over to the Autel booth because they have a press announcement going on shortly. And if you guys haven't watched yet, I put out a video of their Autel Maxi Charger home station. Definitely click on the link up here so that you can watch that, but let's go see what they're ready to unveil. So many of you might not know, but Autel has been in the automotive business for a very long time. They've been actually a part of the diagnostics tools part of the business. And now they're starting to get into the charging station business. It looks like a few DC fast chargers are out here too. So I'm really excited to see what they're gonna unveil today. Looks like here we have a level two charger. It has retractable cables here so that you can really easily plug in your J1772 into your vehicle. I really love this design. It's very sleek and modern. They have quite a few options here as far as charging goes for stations. Looks like there's a cabinet here that might be also holding some modular equipment in order to have energy storage right at the site. This looks like it is a DC fast charging station. They have that RFID card right here, a nice screen on the front. I really like the sleek design that they have going on here at Altau. The booth was jam-packed with residential and commercial products I'd never seen from Autel. It was immediately clear that Autel will quickly emerge as a leader in every segment of the electric fueling network. The presentation only solidified that notion. Hey everyone, we just finished up watching the Autel conference and I wanted to snag my fellow Michigander here. We have John Thomas here. He is the COO of Autel North America. We wanted to ask him a couple of questions about some big announcements that they had today. Give us a briefing real quick of what you just announced today. So we talked about Autel and our total energy management solution, which means we're trying to figure out how to create microgrids within the energy ecosystem. So that'll help from a lot of standpoints, right? Everybody who's driving EVs today is concerned. They're concerned about hey, where do I charge? How do I charge? Will there be enough power to get all these charging stations in place? By creating these microgrids, what we do is we uh, set up battery storage, basically, at the end of the day, that we can deploy where you need it, when you need it, and how you need it. 
So that's a super cool thing. I mean, that's like innovative. Nobody else is really doing that. What's impressive to me is that you guys are taking it from a standpoint where you're kind of attacking the industry from all angles. I mean, you were in the automotive diagnostics tools part of the category, and now you're just like coming out swinging hard yes. in the charging business. So uh, I heard a little bit in the presentation today about your DC fast charging station that can put out up to 480 kilowatts. That's it's mind blowing. Right? So can you give us a little insight on how you're able to deliver that much power? Because that's a lot. And it seems like there's got to be some pretty impressive cooling systems going on there. Yeah. So when you talk about that, like you said, it builds up heat, right? And that's one of the biggest challenges with high power charging. So we actually have a cooling system within our device that helps to cool down the system, manage the heat, dispense that heat out of the system, and allows you to charge at higher powers. And it allows you to charge at higher powers longer. So a lot of systems have to taper off as they get hot, and then they have to reduce the amount of kilowatts you're getting during the charge cycle. Mm -hmm. So we can keep it at higher longer, which means you're gonna be at the charger a lot less time. Can you give us a little insight on the V2X capability of this new charger you have? Yeah, so we can talk a little bit about that. So that's a great question. So V2X is all about vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, vehicle to business. And what it's doing is taking the power and the energy out of a vehicle's battery, and when you need it, transferring it back into your home or your business or wherever you need it to the community to offset the issues with the grid and the availability of power. So as more EV drivers adopt right, and have more of these types of systems, we have a bank of energy sitting out there in the marketplace able to transport that energy out into the market. And it looks like in that case, you do need to have extra equipment in order to have that facilitate back and forth from your energy storage solution, whether that be your car or it looks like you guys have inverters and packs that you might be a one-stop shop for, is that correct? Yes, we are a one-stop shop. So uh, if you just want to set up a basic BDAC system, you don't need anything but our charger and a switch, a switch, which we include in the kit. So it's all, all inclusive. Some other systems, you gotta add on a bunch of stuff, inverter and other stuff. So that one is all inverter inclusive. If you go to the next step and you want a whole energy management system for your home to tie to solar, we also have the inverter side, the battery storage side, and the charging side. So they all work harmoniously through a back end that allows them to decide where energy is, where you wanna put it, when you wanna put it. And I heard you talking a little bit about the AI that's involved, not only in your DC fast charging stations that would be out in the public, but is there involvement there on, on that side of the business as well? There's algorithms and AI in the background that's making decisions based on what's going on in the network within your ecosystem, if you will, whether it's a business or a home. So it's starting to make intuitive decisions based on behaviors and what's going on and how the energy's flowing and balancing that all out. So you can kind of determine if you need to restrict the load or push it out more That's or right. things like that. So right now, the EV infrastructure uh, is kind of under attack because there's a lot of reliability issues. Is there a solution here with what you're providing on your DC fast charging stations in particular? So I can tell you as a user, I'm also an EV driver. I've had struggled with that in the past, right? Where you pull up to a charge station and it kicks you off for whatever reason, you don't know why. And then you have to move somewhere else. So, you know, one of the things I think is special about Autel is you mentioned the diagnostic side of our business. We, in the diagnostic sides, we're working in concert with the vehicle all the time. So we're going to the vehicle telematics, we're figuring out what's going on with the vehicle and all that stuff. That's one of the biggest challenges in EV. A lot of the people don't have that background. So we're an automotive company. So by doing that, what we have is a system where we believe we follow automotive standards. Our products are reliable. They're tested to automotive requirements. In fact, ISO 1511A, a lot of people don't know what that is. That's the handshake between the EV and the, and the charger. So that's really something that's already built into all our chargers. Most EVs don't even have that yet. As they're starting to come out, they will. But so our product's also future proof from that, Sam. So that brings me up to one last question was that you, you said that not a lot of EVs in the marketplace have the features like plug and charge. Or another thing is that you do have uh, really high power bi-directional charging. Is there anything that you guys are doing in order to get these manufacturers on board to bring this technology to life? So I think most of the most of the manufacturers, the OEMs, are working in the direction of ISO 1511A because it's going to be the common language, if you will, across the industry. We are definitely working with OEMs, and you know they want to work with us because we're bringing technology that they haven't seen before, right? They want people that are going to lead them to the next innovation. 
So that's why they're working with Autel. So I believe in concert, the two have to happen in parallel. I, there's, there's three things, right? Batteries, vehicles, and chargers. They all have to work in concert to make it a success. We talked a little bit about the ad portal, mm -hmm. right, on the front. Yeah, and you walk up and you're like, that's, that's new, right? Nobody's really doing this. There's, there's a company called Volta that's doing it, but it's, it's totally yeah, a different based. approach. Yep. But we're not only focused on the ad, that's not where the value is. So as we talk to car companies, you know, you spend a lot of time at a charger. And what if we could turn that charging experience into something of value? So the man to machine interface becomes, this charger is your friend. When you're sitting there and it looks at, when it connects to the car through 15118, it says, hey, you haven't done this to your car. You haven't done, would you like me to make an appointment for you? Um, have, have you thought about going to dinner? You know, like, can I make a reservation for you? Would you like to play video games on that thing? Would you like to watch Netflix? And if you're connected to the car, it comes through the speakers of the car and you can hear it inside your car. So like, you're thinking about it from that standpoint, when we talk to fleets, fleets are like, hey, I can communicate with my employees, right? Bob shows up on Monday to get his truck and it says, happy birthday, Bob, on the portal. You know, people are trying to find ways to communicate with each other because we're not in workplaces anymore. We don't see each other so much. The car dealership thing is starting to go whatever way it goes at the end, but the OEMs still want to connect to their end customer and they won't see them as much. But now they'll see them more frequently with this. So why not use this opportunity to make an, an, a whole inviting event that can really you know, move things forward. And enhance the whole overall the experience. experience, yeah, which I don't think a lot of people are really thinking about. Yeah, we're thinking very big, broad picture. Yeah, so. I can tell. <laughs> this display definitely lends itself to that. Yeah, it's, so. When you walk in, you feel like, some people said, I felt like I walked into an Apple store. I, I feel like I'm walking into my home because this is what I want to see. People at the North American International Auto Show, we have a charging station company that is a huge display here. And it's just so exciting. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We really appreciate it. I loved the Maxi home charger that I reviewed. And if you guys haven't watched it yet, definitely t check out that review because that is a really nice, high quality, excellent user interface product that is an awesome charging station to opt for. So thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you. Yes. Enjoy the rest of the pleasure show. Meeting you, guys. you as well. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited because today I have Robert Gillardi with me today. He's actually in charge of the interior design of this beautiful concept that we have back here, the Lincoln Star. Electric platforms are becoming, I'm seeing here in the Lincoln booth, pretty commonplace, right? Can you give us a little perspective on what that allows you to do as a designer on the interior? Sure. going electric. Absolutely. So, you know, Lincoln is a brand of celebration and occasion, and we always build everything around the human. We talk about sanctuary all the time. So if you look at both of our concepts here, we're at a point where we're celebrating our 100th, 100th anniversary, and we're also in this pivotal point moving from ICE to EV. So if we look at what an EV architecture can allow us to do, it dramatically increases uh, the, the space that we, can, that we can experiment with in the car. Uh, in this one, you'll see that there's a transparent hood. We did that because we want to indicate that there's no engine in there from when you first walk up to the car. But what it also allows us to do is bring the floor of the vehicle all the way to the front. And it takes your vanishing point that used to stop at the instrument panel, now extends it all the way to the front of the vehicle. So it makes it feel very open. It makes it feel very spacious. The other thing that we, we were able to do with this, we actually designed the car from the inside out. We started with the second row passenger, and we built the whole space around it. So we, so we reclined the, uh, the passenger, and by actually kind of tipping them back and putting their legs out, we were able to get the roof line lower, we were able to get the, the sense of space in the vehicle uh, a lot more, and you know, it, it, just, it just allows us to do so many more things. It's, it's, if you think about it, say a, more than 100 years ago, you know, everybody was thinking, what do they do with this new horse's carriage? Now, we're at a point where we're at a clean sheet of paper, and it allows us to do so many more things in the interior by not having the traditional powertrain platform. We can put the passengers further rearward because we don't have the traditional powertrain, and we can use the full length interior from front to trunk all the way through. Fascinating. Now you also have some vehicles in the Chinese market that are kind of going this direction too, am I correct, with the Zephyr? Or mm -hmm. so, so three so far that I'm seeing. Can you give us a little more insight on how is this 
going to be brought to life and okay. when? <laughs> so one of the things that you'll see is the panoramic display that we have in this. This one is curved. The one in the Zephyr, right, is flat, but we're, we're really experimenting with the digital space going coast to coast. So that's something that you'll see that's similar between uh, the Zephyr and this. But what's great about the Star Concept is that it foreshadows three production EVs that will be on the road by 2025. So you will see these, you will see these elements and this thinking uh, represented in those vehicles very shortly. Well, I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Robert, for taking a little bit of time to give us a little bit of insight. On Thank you so much for coming by. We can't wait till they come to life for real. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here at the Ytricity booth and they have a wireless charging system here. It delivers up to 11 kilowatts and over 92% efficiency. But around the other side, it looks like they have some more goodies to show us. They are also doing a demonstration with a Tesla Model 3 that has this equipped on it to be able to utilize it. They said it's going to be around $2,000 or so for a device like this if the vehicle has the capability to take that wireless charge. There are vehicles on the market right now in South Korea that have the Ytricity equipment in them. So these are actually available overseas right now and hopefully will be available here soon in the States. If you look in what is supposed to be a front of the Mustang Mach-E here, they have ripped that out so that they could put in the power receiver down at the bottom. I know my buddy Sandy Monroe would probably like to see something like this. I'm at the Chevy display and right behind me, you probably see there is an Equinox EV on display. This is the first time I'm seeing it in person. Follow me, let's take a peek inside. What's so significant about this vehicle is that it's gonna be a sub $30,000 price point, 250 to 300 miles of range and this is going to be another one of the EVs that are coming to the marketplace that is going to be significant to the business, as long as General Motors can get production to ramp up with their EV programs. Later that day, I tweeted the same notion and GM CEO Mary Barra replied personally, assuring me that they plan to scale. I'm optimistic and believe they'll make it happen. So if you guys remember from my Woodward Dream Cruise display, we saw a bunch of the Chevy EV products on display. And I saw Silverado EV, the Blazer EV, the Bolt, and the Bolt EUV. The screen setup is very similar to what we're seeing in all of the product line, especially when it comes to the Blazer EV and the Silverado EV. Really nice interior, actually. I like the console. It sits up a little bit higher, but we have storage underneath and up on top here. The screens look very nice and clear right in front of you. I'm also seeing we have a head up display. I'm really liking what I'm seeing for this sub $30,000 price point. Obviously this one probably has quite a few options on it, but still aerodynamic door handles. This particular model has the two tone color. So you'll see that pearl metallic finish on the top roof rails. Let's take a look around the front. <laughs> You can see there's an LED strip that goes all the way across and the Chevy logo is illuminated. Hi! <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> you look great! Thank you! For those of you who don't know this woman, she has been a force for good in the EV space for decades. Her projects include GM's EV1 in the 90s, XPRIZE, Plug in America, and most recently, the US Department of Energy. I'll take it as a good sign to run into her next to the Equinox, which may well be GM's first successful mainstream EV. Well, that was a really special moment. I just saw Chelsea Sexton, and we are gonna actually go over to the Harbinger booth because she had a friend with her that had suggested this was pretty cool to see. Essentially, it's a built from the ground up electric commercial platform. So class three, four, five, six-ish is what we're hearing. Let's see what they have over here. Harbinger is touting a platform with an 800 volt liquid cooled battery system with the capacity being scalable in 35 kilowatt hour increments with a projected one hour DC fast charging capability. 
They say they will have the best in class floor height below 28 inches and integrated safety and driver assistance features. They're also claiming to design these systems for a 20 year, 450,000 mile standard operating life with a zero price acquisition premium over today's equivalent gas and diesel powered vehicles. The founders of the company include John Harris, the CEO, who came from companies like Boeing, Faraday Future, and Exos Trucks, Philip Weicker, the CTO, who was the former co-founder and head of powertrain at Canoe, and also worked at Faraday Future and QuantumScape, and Will Eberts, the COO, who also worked at Canoe and Faraday Future. Harbinger says their first vehicles are expected to be in customers' hands in late 2023, followed by the launch of volume production in 2024. There were many more EVs to see at the show, like the Buick Wildcat concept and Dodge Charger Daytona SRT Banshee concept, and even some electric vehicle takeoff and landing vehicles. But we ran out of time to see it all. We hope you enjoyed this coverage of the North American International Auto Show and appreciate you tuning in. Please consider subscribing so we can continue to bring you more electrifying content. Until next time, drive, fly, ride. Go electric.